morning saxophon. Can I get like a big whoop from everybody? So good morning, saxophon. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Heather. And thank you for everybody. Interhealth. And thank you so much for, for this amazing conference and these four human individuals who are going to help us out here. So what we have here is a project called Climate Symphony. Now, my name is Leah Borromeo. And I'm working with two other people who are currently in London, uh, Catherine Round and Jamie Pereira, who's our composer, and Catherine's a filmmaker. Um, Jeff, I'm having issues with this. Sorry. So essentially, what we're what we're doing is Climate Symphony is a live music and visual performance sort of created with data to tell us the story of cl what climate change means through sound. So what we do is we take climate change data and we're turning it into a symphony to tell us the story of our dying planet. So this is kind of the first time that it's been done to this scale. There have been other times when people have done it for more academic purposes or for things on the news or for things in various sort of, various sort of ways, but actually this is kind of the first time data has been performed like this with an orchestra. Um, these are four people, but we're planning at least nine. And hello. Oh. <laughs> so here we have the sound of a cello. Um, can we get a little bit level of level on that? Can you guys hear that? Great. Okay, so how do you feel about that? You know, so, and how would you feel if I told you that this was data? This is the sound of the Earth's mean temperature rising and falling over time. Now, this sounds created from data points and that's sort of translated into notes and phrases and pauses and beats um, in a process known as data sonification. So it's kind of like what Hans Rosling did with visualization, but with sound. That crinkling noise that you hear is the sound of CO2. And those are the CO2 levels in our atmosphere. So that sort of starts peaking in intensity to represent the rise of CO2. And then we're going to slowly hear, slowly hear the, there we are, I'm supposed to do that. Um, I love the little Mac symbol up here. You know? That's the sound of rising levels in our oceans. You start hearing that string section coming up. And you'll hear the actual sound of the ocean. And then at some point you'll hear some woodwind. And that rises in pitch to kind of illustrate our increasing fossil fuel consumption. And so there's three different data sets within that, wo that woodwind. And then you'll hear a sort of steam engine that sort of marks the sort of point in history at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So those are the building blocks of the Climate Symphony. Now, why sound? Okay, why data? Because sound affects us in a kind of primal way, I suppose. It, you know, we, we kind of, it has a physiological, psychological, and kind of emotional and behavioral effect on us. It, it hits us in our limbic system. You know, just so as we can hear sort of sounds on the blackboard, it makes you go, uh, or if you hear the sound of an alarm, it actually makes you, you know, rise up. So when you combine this with climate data and live performance, it invites you to feel the story of climate change. Notice how I said, feel the story. And you can feel the story of our dying planet, and it gives hard data a human meaning. So the whole sort of performance thing, this is, this is what roughly going to be able to look like. So you can imagine what we'd call a kind of like inverse proscenium arch, and we'll have some screens on either side here, and then there's going to be sort of immersive visuals that will sort of, you know, come up onto those screens, and the audience will be right here. So we essentially, you know, when, you know how you've ever been to a gig and you get kind of caught up in the whole sweeping feel of the music, but also you're bouncing off the energy of all the people around you. And so you're there and you're digging it, and next thing you know, 40 minutes are gone, and you just want, you want it again. So that's the kind of feeling that we, we really want people to sort of come away with when they come and when they visit Climate Symphony. 
So now this is a kind of basic prototype of the visuals. Um, this, is, this has changed quite dramatically since, and it's actually simplified since we first came up with it. But these will sort of help create that immersive experience, right? So imagine those projections surrounding you. And then slowly lines will start appearing around you. And then here's that cello again that represents the Earth's temperature. And so the visuals will move in accordance to the data. And the sort of swirl of red represents the heat. And you know, you'll, 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 you'll be able to figure it out through a lot of sort of visual cues. And then you get sort of simple text like the temperature rising here, parts per million, CO2 levels are in there. We'll start seeing some archive of the Arctic ice. And then we're moving into the Industrial Revolution. And again, you see more sort of key text cues. And so this is a kind of artist representation of what it might look like in an installation space or in kind of an, of an art space. But if you sort of imagine that larger, um, that's kind of what you will get um, when you're surrounded by that in performance. So these are what we call sort of story beats. So climate symphonies using the symphonic structure, which is a musical narrative structure, um, which basically has four movements and an epilogue. The first part is reflective. Okay, so that, this is the beginning of the Holocene, roughly 11,000 years ago. CO2 levels are stable, Earth's temperature fluctuates, but it just leads to kind of human settlements. Um, agriculture starts up, we start having religion, we start learning about money. Sometimes it might be this one and the same thing. We're affecting the Earth, but not in a big way. And then we reach a period what we call the optimistic period. It's upbeat. The industrial revolution starts. You know, it starts booming, and fossil fuels start burning, and we start thinking about possibilities and how great all these possibilities can be. We're looking positive, but we don't know the price of this progress, which eventually becomes instability. Cheap energy has allowed us to start sort of waging war on a global scale, be it through religion or money. Um, population, CO2 levels, they're all sort of the fossil fuel use keeps rising. And then it comes to this point of intensity. So we're out of control. We're basically consuming like there's no tomorrow. And if we keep consuming, there probably won't be. And, but the speed of environmental change is, is unprecedented. You know, we're kind of, we can't seem to stop. Our tech addiction's kind of gone out of control. We're devouring resources and extreme weather events become much more common, much more normalized. Heather was telling us about the floods here in Saxifaha and where, you know, where the flood levels rose and how the, even this local community is actually affected by climate change. So we're in the midst of what, what they call a kind of sixth global extinction. And so at the climax of the piece is the present day. It's relatively quiet. You know, this is kind of now. This is the golden age of climate change, where it's not really going to get any better than this. So, oh, hello. Did I just press a button? I did, didn't I? Uh, my apologies, that's just me. So, this is what we've got when we're actually working in the studio. And so why are we using sound to communicate data? So there's two reasons. One, sound is a kind of new way to represent these sort of temporal patterns and changes in data. So if you think about a Geiger counter, and as something becomes more intense, the clicky, clicky, clicky becomes louder and louder and much more frequent. You know, so far so simple. But then we also think that sound provokes this emotional response. And so here we have that data set for Arctic sea ice extent, and that's the bit we've sonified. And that's what it looks like in our MIDI. And, you know, on, or at least logic, but... And this is what it sounds like. Guys?
Thank you. So this is CO2, parts per million. It's just kind of an ever-increasing hill that goes up, and you can sort of imagine Sisyphus over here pushing that boulder up there. Um, and that's what it is when we're working on it. And this kind of CO2 is if we can get somebody to sort of crumple some paper, just kind of just, you know, try to hear this sort of crumpling, crim crinkling sound. Uh, is that mic on? Thank you. And this is migration in the Mediterranean. Now, what's the connection between climate change and migration? Now, that's, that's, that's another talk for another day. But these are the routes from West Africa, the Western Mediterranean, Central Mediterranean, the East Mediterranean route. And it kind of includes sort of irregular migrants. Um, nice little sort of peak there. Um, and this is what it looks like on there. And this is what it sounds like. This is not exactly a graph or any kind of chart, but it's just a bunch of information which we've sort of gleaned from, you know, I know Wikipedia and all of that, but it's a list of the floods in Pakistan. So it, it means that, you know, data can come from basically anywhere as long as you've done the due diligence on it. Um, and these are what Pakistan floods look like on our system. And this is what it sounds like. <laughs> And so you put it all together, and um, all right.
thank you. Thank you so much. Now, how did that make you feel? As a kind of, just, just, out, just from out of the blue, anybody just shout whatever they want to, say, want to shout. Neglected. Neglected. Oh, reflective. <laughs> so I suddenly go like, oh, money issues. No, but... Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it is, it is quite sad, but it, it is about sort of framing and, and how we do it. So I'm, I'm going to whiz quite quickly through, you know, things that we've come up with so that, that, that make this part what it is. Accessibility is one of the things we're, we're looking at. So how do we engage people? And how do we engage an audience? Um, and also, you know, why, you know, why does sound sound the way it sounds? Accuracy. So it's more about the methodology and about how accurately you have to actually represent the data. In this case, we have, we're sticking to it as 100% as we can, um, so that it counts. You know, it's, but it asks questions of how accurately it has to be represented in order for it to count. Narrative. If you were here yesterday, we talked about story and storytelling. What story are you trying to tell? You know, and. So this is something which is, you know, like a, a big kind of cluster of everything. But when we think of data science, we think of kind of this objective truth, a kind of dispassionate authority that we have to believe. But actually, what we have to really look at are the different players and, and actors involved. So you have neoliberalism there, you have sort of a ecological modernization there, climate justice movements, climate scientists, a climate contrarian, all of those different factors actually come in to play a part in the story that you're trying to tell. So data contributes to narratives that kind of either reflect or represent your own bias as opposed to what's known as a kind of truth. So visualization here, it leads to something we, what we call digital positivism. Um, or also so sonification as well. So it's where digital methods are kind of assume an authority associated with a kind of imperial work within the hard sciences. There's a kind of authority that's not necessarily justified. So every time we do a piece, we make a piece, we have to question ourselves as to why we're trying to tell this story, what are we trying to, you know, what we're trying to communicate. And because, you know, data itself kind of tries to sell itself as politically neutral, but it isn't. There's so many factors involved in data collection as to who's funded it, who's collecting it, what technology you're able to use, you know, what's the framework for which this collection is actually happening. So there's so many different factors that you have to actually play into. And this is what we also look at when we do our due diligence with data. Um, I do like this bit where data is never raw. It's always structured according to somebody's predispositions and values. Um, so you always have to be quite mindful of that, especially when you're making a piece like this. But then there's also data wash. This is the sort of, you know, essentially what you can't, um, it's kind of how you're kind of critically approaching the data. So, you know, it's how you conceal or obscure information um, around sort of issues of con like controversy. And there's a kind of guy who called um, Max Roser, who did does something called One World in Data. And he aims to explore the ongoing history of human civilization um, through data visualization. So as a quick example, this is him saying, declining racial violence in the US since 1882. These, or that, is the data around lynchings in the United States since 1882. You're thinking, hey, so far, so positive and liberal. But what it doesn't take into effect, or, or at least or take into consideration, see, that, see that, that's dropping down there, is that it doesn't necessarily account for all of the racial violence within America. So lynching's not that common these days, but that doesn't mean other forms of violence don't exist, like such as killings by the police. And he does a similar thing around sort of natural catastrophes. And you know, an improvement over time about how humans have been able to sort of survive this, but it doesn't kind of, you know, it doesn't show you the, the scopes of deaths and how some of those deaths actually may have actually come about that don't involve natural catastrophes, um, but might involve factories collapsing, for instance. And this is the data that you don't see, the dark data. We have to consider that as well. So every, you know, when, when Susan Sontag said to frame is to exclude, you have to think about what you're not being told. So within this piece that you've heard, yes, you feel sad. Yes, you feel reflective. Why do you feel sad? Why do you feel reflective? What's missing? 
So for every story that we tell, we always have to ask, you know, what is missing? We have to kind of filter through all of these messages. And this actually leads us back to the theme of Switchpoint, which is tenacity. This, this kind of requires a tenacity to be able to tackle the most uncomfortable parts of data and your research. And what my mom calls stick to itiveness, and just to actually, regardless of what the results and what you find, stick to it and just sort of commit to the data that you're using, or rather the data that you're not using. And so that leads us to agenda. You know, what are you actually trying to say? And then, art. Is what we're doing art? Is what we're doing journalism? You know, when this concept came about, it was this idea that we could use sound as a reporting tool, as a way for people to be able to communicate facts, but in an emotional way to people. And so what you see here is a kind of sonification sandwich. Um, I know we've just had breakfast, but if you fancy eating it later, I'll be more than happy to talk you through it. But you've got your accessibility, your narrative, which, which basically, and your agenda, which is a kind of a bread. And it surrounds your narrative, it surrounds your accuracy, and it surrounds your art. And that's kind of what we're offering to you guys. You know? So we have this kind of sonification, but it's got like an oral flavor to it. So thank you very much, everybody, for listening. And um, please enjoy the rest of the conference.